that sound good? Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. My name, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. My name is Rebecca. Uh, I'm a volunteer with NOFA Mass, and you are attending hosting beneficial creatures in your farm or garden with Danny Baker. And before we jump in, I just have a few details to review with you. Um, to start, we're going to start with a land acknowledgement. And this conference is presented on land that has been stewarded by Indigenous people since before European colonization. As we work to heal the destruction caused by colonization, we appreciate your support, solidarity, and continued learning. I personally am currently on Nipmuc and Pecumtuck land, um, and I invite everyone to drop in the chat whose land uh, you are calling from. And I think David has dropped a link in the chat if you aren't sure and would like to look it up. So I'll pause a little bit while people do that. Okay, uh, I really encourage you if you haven't used that tool before to find out whose unseated land you're on that you really do yourself a favor and find out. Um, okay, so with uh, Buen Vivar as our theme, we aim to bring light to the ancestral wisdoms of indigenous people of the global south, um, including the Aymara, uh, Kwekua, and Mapuche people, sorry for butchering those words, we celebrate that restorative agriculture is rooted in longstanding cultural practices of black, indigenous, and other people of color. In an agricultural system that's built on stolen land and the forced labor and exploitation of black, indigenous, and other people of color, our conference aims to center equity in our food system. And there are these wonderful caucus groups that you can join on Saturday to um, learn more and be in community with people to talk about this. Um, and here are some ways that you can center racial equities in your communities. And if you, there are some groups in your local communities that you'd like to share that are doing uh, racial equity work, uh, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, we'd like to thank our partner level sponsor, Stony Field Organic. And we have a number of sponsors who help make our conference possible, and I encourage you to purchase from them. And when you do, let us know, or let them know that you appreciate them supporting NOFA Mass. A couple more announcements about the conference. Um, you can bring a small soil sample from home and visit the soil health table on Saturday. NOFA Mass staff will be available to offer technical assistance and recommendations. And finally, uh, we've got some incredible items to bid on in our online auction. David will drop the link to some of those auction items to, and you can see the lineup and bid there. Um, so that is the end of my little talk that I have to do. Um, and I will introduce Danny Baker. Uh, Danny Baker is a self-taught gardener and organic farmer who began planning and planting her permaculture-inspired edible forest garden in 2013. Her book, The Home Scale Forest Garden, How to Plan, Plant, and Tend a Resilient Edible Landscape was published by Chelsea Green in May of 2022. Danny loves to inspire others to embark on their own edible forest adventure at any scale. Um, and I turn it over to you, Danny. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Good, okay, great. So welcome, thank you all for attending and thank you for allowing me to present this program. Um, hosting beneficial creatures in your farm or garden and down below is my contact information, which I'll put on the last screen as well. So 
to begin. Just to let you know where my organic farm is located, it is um, where that star is. So it's on an island in the St. Lawrence River, um, very northern New York State. It's almost, it's literally a stone's throw from Canada. And it's about two hours south, southeast of, of Ottawa. So this is our farm logo. The, the green is the actual shape of the island. It's about a nine mile long island. Interstate access. I-81 goes to this island and over to Canada. So we don't need a boat to get to our farm. And our farm is actually located right at the base of that windmill. We do have wind and solar power on our farm. We are very diversified. We raise meat goats, we raise beef cows, cattle, we raise some ducks and chickens, we do annual vegetables, and um, we have a few campsites on our farm. We host volunteers year round. We give tours. This is a picture of me giving a tour in the edible forest. And we also occasionally have an event. So um, 11 years ago, I attended a two hour class on permaculture. I'd never heard the term before, but I was curious. And before the end of the two hours, the concepts made so much sense to me that I decided there and then I was gonna plant an edible forest. I came home, I told my partner I need a fence because we have a lot of deer pressure on Wellesley, a lot. So he was kind enough to find a half acre that he wasn't using for his pasture. He put a nice good fence around it and I started to plan and plant the garden. So here are just a few shots of the garden. This is like early summer. Peonies are edible, by the way, the flowers. This is a little later in the summer. Here's a spring shot on the left and a fall shot on the right and a winter shot. We're in zone four, hardiness zone four. So our average minimum temperature in the winter is between minus 20 and minus 30. So anything I can grow, you can grow. But I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm talking about hosting beneficial creatures. So this is my book, The Homescale Forest Garden, How to Plan, Plant, and Tend a Resilient Edible Landscape. And everything I'm going to talk about, I've kind of learned from uh, my research to develop my garden uh, and my observations of the garden over the years. So um, attracting beneficial creatures. So we want to attract pollinators. So we want to have food for pollinators blooming somewhere on our property from, or from early, as early in the season as possible to as late in the season as possible. We want to ha have plants for beneficial insects in the garden, which I'll be talking about in some detail. We want habitat for arachnids or spiders. We want habitat and food for birds, habitat for raptors and owls and for reptiles and amphibians. I'm gonna talk about all of these. So first pollinators. So many different insects will perform pollinating functions. Moths and butterflies, honeybees, ants in the upper right, um, bumblebees, and I don't see what's on this, oh, minus, maybe I can minus this, oh, yeah. Um, Oh, and wasps and you know all kinds of flying insects, crawling insects will pollinate. Flies pollinate pawpaws. So you want to have as much diversity as you can so you can attract all of these different pollinators. So I mentioned food for pollinators through the season. So I'm actually gonna go through the seasons and show you some plants that you can grow that will attract pollinators. So in April, this is a cornelian cherry that is blooming before anything leaves out. And so the, the, pronation, the, um, the pollinators that are out and about, like bumblebees, for example, early, early in the season um, will have something to eat. And then uh, Juneberry is up here, um, dandelions and um, other native, well, dandelions aren't native, but other things that just grow in the pasture. And then crocuses or, or you know, tulips, things like that, that you plant yourself. Tulips are actually next month in my region. So tulips, um, all the herbs that flower, like chives, um, this is, a, I think, a plum tree with a robin sitting in it. And then um, this is a crabapple tree, So, and this is a, um, a beach plum bush. 
So all of your, your flowering fruit trees and bushes are relevant in May. And if you have your pollinators around, they're there to pollinate your fruit trees and your berry bushes. And then in June, um, upper left is Russian comfrey. This is aronia. Um, this is a, a, a blooming black locust tree. Um, the blooms are edible, by the way. Um, these are roses that are attracting bumblebees and um, uh, lupin. And this is actually a, um, a peony with a bumblebee in it. So those are all in June blooming. Then summer, you have your uh, echinacea, you have your borage, your, all your daylilies, um, your elderberry, uh, wildflowers like, like the um, black-eyed Susans. And this is actually a, a North Bay, is it North Bay? Something Bay magnolia flower with a white moth in it. And then September, the wildflowers like the wild asters and the, um, the goldenrod, these are um, sunchokes that are related to sunflowers and they bloom in September. And then the plants around ponds that are blooming. October, the borage is still blooming. I have, I have day neutral strawberries that continue to bloom right into the fall. Um, and then this is actually a saffron crocus. So Vermont, the University of Vermont and, and the Cooperative Extension there is really big on growing saffron crocuses in the North Country. And I've been growing them myself. So that blooms in October, as opposed to the crocuses you're familiar with, which bloom in the spring. And then November, this is actually a, uh, a um, goji plant. It's related to the tomato, goji berry. And you can see the blooms look very much like tomato blossoms, only they're all different colors. And this plant actually blooms and produces fruit right into December for me, which is pretty amazing. And then of course, dandelions come back and the goldenrod and um, the uh, Queen Anne's lace is, is blooming all the time. And this is a, um, a perennial sweet pea that's very frost resistant and will continue to bloom right into November. And then, of course, this is a little different subject. So we're done with the months. So all of the herbs are very, very attractive to all kinds of pollinators. So if you have herbs scattered about of all kinds, this is a, an apple mint. This is a, a, um, anise, anise hyssop, which is native. Um, this is a garlic chive. These are, um, I believe, oregano. Um, and all of these are very attractive. I have a dog whining next to me, I apologize. <laughs> so what are some of the beneficial insects? We talked about pollinators. Now, beneficial insects are insects that actually predate on your pest insects. So you have your praying mantis, your, your um, uh, excuse me a second. I gotta get rid of the dog. Out. Oh. I apologize. Hopefully it won't happen again. Okay. Um, ladybugs, um, lace wings, um, all the ground beetles eat bugs. Um, this is a hoverfly. And then this is one of my favorite um, beneficial insects. This is greatly magnified, but this is a, a parasitic wasp. So these are tiny little wasps, maybe um, a quarter, an eighth of an inch long. There's several varieties. And if you have um, uh, lots of flowers that they like, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, and they're around, when they're ready to lay their eggs, they lay them on or in soft uh, surface bugs like caterpillars. So they will predate on your caterpillars in a vegetable garden. They'll eat, they'll uh, lay their eggs in your potato beetles and other soft surface um, uh, pests, and they'll just take care of it for you. So you don't have to do anything. You don't have to spray or anything. Um, and so these are some of the, the plants that are particularly attractive to beneficial insects. The whole carrot family. So that would include um, fennel, dill, um, uh, parsley that is a biannual, will bloom the second year, 
Um, I don't know that yarrows in the carrot family, but anything with very tiny blossoms, because those wasps are so tiny, they need, um, well, the wasps and the wasps in particular need very small blossoms, but all of the beneficial insects will feed on all of these kinds of plants. So this is elderberry, um, anything in the, um, the daisy family, like these wild asters or the daisies and all the herbs, of course. So if you just have all of these kinds of very small flowered plants around, you're gonna be feeding your um, beneficial insects and they'll be there to take care of your pests. Um, spiders. So spiders um, are wonderful. They're, they're omnivores, they'll eat anything they can catch. So if you can invite them into your garden, your vegetable garden or, or whatever kind of, of food garden you have, um, they will take care of business for you. So they like, um, they like big, fat, leafy plants like rhubarb, like hosta, like comfrey. They like to shelter in those plants. They like piles of rocks or stone. And um, this is a garden um, spider. It's quite a large spider and uh, very beneficial. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about attracting beneficial insects to vegetables. So in my vegetable gardens, I let dill self-seed. So here's dill growing out of a row of beets. Hey, you know, they get along and the dill provides me a free, um, a free herb that I can sell. Meanwhile, the flowers are feeding all my beneficial insects. Um, here is um, cilantro that I let go to flower and go to seed. So then I have coriander and I also am feeding all my insects. And this also self-seeds. So I never plant any of this stuff. It just grows by itself and I let it grow. I don't weed it out. And so it's providing all those benefits. And here I believe is an elderberry that I have right on the edge of my garden. So one year I planted a row of elderberries as a windbreak uh, on the windward side of my vegetable garden. And that year I happened to have 700 foot rows of potatoes to the lee of the elderberries. And I was accustomed to scouting for potato bugs starting sometime in June for three or four weeks and you know, squishing up and down the rows twice a day and squishing all the bugs I found by hand. And this particular year when I had the elderberries planted, I started scouting for potato bugs and half of them were already dead because the elderberries were blooming right at the time that the potato bugs came around and the beneficial wasps were feeding on the elderberries and then they were going uh, with the wind into my field and just, you know, murdering all of the potato bugs. And for many years after that, um, the potato bugs were just taken care of by all the beneficial plants I had around. Um, down in the lower um, quadrant here is parsley. So um, occasionally my parsley will winter over, it's a biannual. So the second year, it will flower. And those flowers, of course, are also in the carrot family and they will feed the beneficials. And then here in the middle of a row of potatoes, I let the milkweed grow. Hey, it's not bothering anything and it'll hopefully feed some, some uh, butterflies. Cover crops are another way to attract beneficials. So early in the season, you have your mustards. Then, you know, coming up in June, maybe July, you have your buckwheat. Um, all of the legumes are very useful. So hairy vetch is a legume that I actually allow to grow. Um, I've always let it grow among my vegetables because it fixes nitrogen. And I've also observed it's a trap crop for aphids. I don't know if any of you have seen that, but I've seen aphids on the stems of my, um, my hairy vetch when they're not on my peppers, they're not on my kale, they're not on any of the vegetables that I have my hairy vetch growing around. And then, you know, the red clovers, the crimson clover, this is a um, sweet yellow clover. All of these are very attractive to beneficial insects and pollinators. And uh, what I like to do in my vegetable garden, like my, my um, I harvested my garlic and I threw in uh, some buckwheat and also um, I decided to do an experiment this year and I mixed it with some millet. So my plan is when the buckwheat flowers um, and the bees stop being interested in it, I'm gonna weed whack it um, and take the millet down as well, because the millet will just regrow. And then I'll take the millet down one more time if I have to, so it doesn't go to seed. And then the millet will actually form a really nice straw-like mulch. It'll get winter killed and it'll form a straw-like mulch on the ground. But anyway, that's a different 
a different topic. I'm just talking about, I, I just wanted to talk about really the cover crops that are very attractive to beneficial insects. So now that you have all your beneficial insects around, um, here's another um, category of animals, um, of native creatures that will take care of your pests, your bugs, and that is birds. So this is actually a nest, a robin's nest that's sitting on uh, the door of a hoop house in my garden. I love having them. So these are a number of birds that are, are that you know either migrate to my region or a native or stay winter over in my region that will eat bugs and caterpillars. So um, the, the Baltimore Oriole doesn't winter over here, but it does come around. This is a, um, a tree swallow, and this eats bugs on the fly, like a bat. Um, the uh, woodpeckers, of course, will eat bugs in, you know, in the wood of trees. Um, chickadees, um, tell me what this is. You know what it is. Hello. Goldfinch. A goldfinch, exactly. Goldfinch, red-winged blackbirds. Um, now they are pesty. You know, they can eat grain and you know stuff like that. But mm, um, and this is a uh, nuthatch. And then robins, of course, and uh, is that a wren? I think, yeah. So all of these birds will, will, eat, um, will eat bugs, but they, they forage in different places. And this is why you wanna have a bumpy landscape. You wanna have tall trees, short trees, um, bushes, open grounds, the robins like the open ground, um, herbaceous plants, you wanna have all levels. So you're providing, um, nesting habitat and also foraging habitat for all the beneficial birds that will then eat your bugs, um, especially in June when they're feeding their young. Young chicks need a lot of protein and birds will eat a lot of bugs that time of year and take care of business for you. In a vegetable garden, if you have hedgerows around your gardens that also have multiple layers, you can see tall trees here and bushes and some herbaceous plants, that will attract your birds and they'll be there to forage in your garden for bugs. Here's some other options. So I left some stumps um, in my edible forest and when they got infested with bugs, the woodpeckers came in and, and ate the bugs and left nice little holes for birds to nest in. So chickadees in particular like to nest in things like this. And then um, this, I just took this shot like this week a robin is is uh, is still nesting in one of my plum trees. So, and then um, I forget the name of this bird, but it likes to nest on dry ground or even though this is like a uh, stone. Um, and then this is a robin's nest right on the ground um, where the daffodils have died died off. And then of course, providing birdhouses around your, in your field or around your garden so that for those birds that do like to nest in houses, and this is a, a tree sparrow feeding her young, um, there'll, be, there'll be that kind of um, habitat for them. So I love this slide. This shows you what birds do. So I went up to, um, there's a, a wonderful organic permaculture orchard called um, Miracle Farm. It's in Southern Quebec. And I went there for a tour and Stefan said, when he sees an, a caterpillar nest on a branch of one of his fruit trees, he does nothing. And I, I freaked out. What do you mean you do nothing? If you don't do something, they're gonna eat the whole tree. He goes, no, he had hundreds of birdhouses around his five acre orchard. And he said, no, the birds come and they take care of the caterpillars before they move to another branch. So I decided to try that. So I installed, once I learned that, I installed birdhouses in my garden. And this particular nest, I left alone. It was on a plum, a branch of a plum tree. And a few weeks later, I mean, a few days later, that's what happened. The birds came, they ate all the caterpillars they could find. And then actually, the ones they missed actually got bigger and grew again and created a little more of a nest. And then they came and took care of them for good. So if you have birds around and you're willing to trust, this is what can happen. Okay, now, birds also eat berries. <laughs> and that can be a problem at times. Um, there's certain berries that I have to net to make sure the birds don't get them before they're ripe enough for me to pick them. But um, I also like to leave 
some for the birds. So I just want to talk about, you know, different times of year, what kind of berries you might be growing that the birds might enjoy. So of course, early in the spring, uh, these are alpine strawberries. This is honeyberries. Now the birds love honeyberries. They're, they're ripe in June. And um, what I like to do is I, I net my honeyberries to protect them, but I leave a couple of bushes unnetted. So I'm hoping that the birds will be happy with the ones they can get to and they won't try to get under my net as much. But I do, when I net berry bushes, I do scout twice a day because the birds do inevitably get under there from time to time. And I, I want to get, get them out before they eat all my berries, number one. And number two, I want to make sure I let them out before they get stuck in the net and die. So I just scout a couple of times. Sometimes this past year, I, I found birds getting under a net every day and I found there was a big hole in the net. And once I shored up the hole, um, they didn't get in anymore. So raspberries, and these are um, gooseberries. And these are all ripe in June and the birds like them. So, you know, you might wanna net them um, if you need to. Um, my raspberries actually did not get eaten because I have, I had um, this year, these are preludes, they're, they're, they ripen in late June, or early July. Um, I had a mulberry tree nearby that had fruit, a lot, it was loaded with fruit this year. And of course that's like a trap crop for birds. Birds much prefer mulberries to a lot of other things that might be ripe at the same time. So they took care of my birds. I didn't have any problem with my raspberries this year. Summer foods. So these are beach plums. These are black um, blackberries. These are sand cherries. Um, these are um, uh, these are um, clove currants, which is a native currant, and elderberries, of course. So all of these are are uh, ripening in the summer. Birds particularly like elderberries. So if you pepper your your um, whatever it is, your garden, your vegetable garden, or your your fruit forest with elderberries, the birds will prefer these to a lot of other fruits that might be ripe at the same time. So that's a trap crop also, which I would recommend. And fall food. So especially when the grapes start ripening and the elderberries are ripe, the, um, the birds much prefer the elderberries to the grapes, so they leave my grapes alone. And then these are, these are the goji berries, which you know are start ripening for me like in the fall. And this is aronia that ripens in September. And then winter food. So um, this is a high bush cranberry that often holds its berries all winter long. A thistle, which feeds the finches. Um, this is a juniper. And I know birds eat these berries over the winter. Any kind of um, herbaceous plant, this is, happens to be the um, the uh, garlic chive, but you know anything that you can leave standing. You really shouldn't cut down any of these, like um, echinacea, any flowers that have seeds, or any wildflowers that have seeds. Leave them up all winter. The birds will eat them, and the beneficial insects will actually overwinter in the stems and in in the galls. And then it's plenty of time in the spring to you know to. Uh, push them down if you want to, although they'll naturally fall down by themselves. Um, and then of course, feeding birds. So I do feed, um, I feed uh, black oil sunflower mainly in my bird feeders over the winter. Okay, so attracting birds to vegetables. Um, again, putting birdhouses around, and this is interesting. This is um, a baffle that I made out of a stovepipe. Um, to keep snakes and rodents from climbing up and, and getting at the eggs or the chicks. So that's something you can consider doing. Um, so having these around your vegetable gardens, having uh, anything that, that a bird can survey the garden on top of. So sunflowers are great, or if you have trellises, birds like to sit on top of trellises and survey the garden for pests. And here's just an example. Um, my hoop houses are not covered right now with plastic. So I'm growing a pole beans up a trellis in the hoop house. And you can see the holes. There was a bug here. But guess what? There was also a bird here that came and took care of the bugs and also fertilized. <laughs> so um, yeah, just attracting birds to vegetables. And of course, I mentioned the hedgerow. 
Okay, so now here's a whole nother class of birds, the raptors, the bats, and the owls, that they predate on rodents. And if you're like me, rodents can be a big problem in a garden. So you want to attract these as best you can. And the ways that um, I've attempted to do it, I have a bat house on a telephone pole that's yet to be occupied by bats, but there it is. I understand there's someone nearby who knows how to um, put like bat doo-doo there to attract bats. So I, I think he's gonna get in touch with me and maybe I'll be able to um, have some bats. For raptors, for all the hawks, um, it's good to have a roost like this high up. So you can see in this picture, there's a high tunnel and here's the raptor perch. So that raptor is gonna come during the day or an owl will actually sit on there at night and survey the land and you know take care of your rodents. So for a screech owl, this is a, a, a possible um, nesting box for a screech owl right on the edge of the woods. Um, unfortunately, to my knowledge, the only thing that's occupied it so far has been a squirrel because my partner climbed up a ladder to clean it out one spring and a squirrel jumped out in his face. But I'm still hopeful. And then this is, um, is a similar kind of nest for um, a kestrel, which is a small hawk. Um, and it likes to look, this is on a telephone pole overlooking the field where I hope the kestrel will, um, will be hunting for rodents. But unfortunately, I've yet to have a kestrel take up residence there, but I'm trying. You can try too. Um, Oh yes, and I did want to mention fox. So foxes eat rodents and they have a wonderful way of hunting them. They dive into the snow head first. If you've ever seen it, it's quite amusing. But here's fox tracks in my, in order to have foxes in your garden, you have to have a fence that they can get through or under. So I have two half acre gardens. One has a really high test fence that foxes cannot get into. And the other one has just one ribbon, one hot, one electrified ribbon. So the foxes can easily get in and out. So in that garden, there I don't have any problem with rodents or rabbits. In my garden where the foxes are, are excluded, I have problems with rodents and rabbit, rabbits. So if you can invite foxes into your garden, they're very beneficial. Moving on to reptiles and amphibians. Now these animals eat bugs, they eat slugs, snakes will eat rodents, so you want to invite them in. You want to give them habitat that they like. And um, just to, so this is a, uh, a snapping turtle. This shot I just took yesterday. It's a tree frog sitting on a leaf of, at, it's actually a, um, a nitrogen fixing plant in my garden. And these things are so tiny. There may be, um, oh, half an inch long but they've got to eat little bugs, right? They're frogs. So, and this is a black snake. They eat rodents for sure. Um, frogs, leopard frogs and newts. So um, for newts, they really like rotten logs. So if you can leave some rotten logs and sometimes rocks, um, leave some of those piled up around in your garden, you can attract newts and they'll eat bugs for you. Um, I find last year, um, I kind of, the herbaceous plants, the wild herbaceous plants got away from me and they grew very tall. We had a drought and um, they grew very tall and were very dense and they collected a lot of dew every night. So I had the biggest, um, just everywhere were leopard frogs. They were living in the moist moisture underneath all these herbaceous plants, which you might call weeds, but they were obviously benefiting the wildlife. And I think mosquitoes were breeding under them. And I think the leopard frogs were eating the mosquitoes. So um, it's good though, to have a water feature if you want to attract um, amphibians and, and reptiles. So this is just a little dug pond in my, my second garden, my second half acre. There was a spot that was wet, certainly very, you know, there was standing water spring and fall. And I thought, I'll just dig a pond there. So I dug the pond and I threw the dirt on top of that Hugo culture mound on the left that I was building right nearby. And so any, any water feature is going to attract all the amphibians, it's gonna attract turtles, it's gonna attract um, some water snakes and also dragonflies, which will eat your mosquitoes. 
So you can just dig a simple pond or you can use a machine and dig a bigger pond, which are also very aesthetically pleasing in any kind of garden space. So these are shots of a couple of my ponds in the spring. Um, these are shots in the summer. And um, so much for ponds. Okay, let's talk trap crops. So another way to deal with pests is to have trap crops. So I already mentioned the elderberry and the um, uh, mulberry. Mulberry, thank you. <laughs> That's two. Um, and the mulberries that are very attractive to birds, more attractive than a lot of your more valuable um, berry crops. So definitely having some of them around. Now, I've also discovered that this is a thimbleberry. It's, it's native, it's wild, and you can also plant it. Very attractive to Japanese beetles, more attractive to Japanese beetles than raspberries. So if you have some thimbleberries in your woods or you, know, you plant them in your gardens or around your gardens, the Japanese beetles will tend to congregate there and not on your more valuable crops. Likewise, this is a Ragusa rose, and I find that roses are trap crops for, for the um, Japanese beetles as well. They tend to congregate right inside the blossoms. So um, of course, if you, they're gonna like any kind of rose. So if you have tea roses, they're gonna like them too, but um, I, don't, I can't grow them up my way, it's too cold. But I have Ragusa roses and the Japanese beetles congregate there and they stay away from other more valuable plants. Now, lower right, you can see the aphids on the hairy vetch. See all those lavender colored bumps? Those are all aphids congregating on my hairy vetch. And in fact, when I first saw them, I said to a friend who was a much more experienced gardener than I am, I said, oh, that must be why they call them hairy vetch because there's all those hairs on the stems. And she goes, no, Danny, those are aphids. So anyway, if you let hairy vetch grow wherever you are growing plants that you, you value, and if there are aphids around, they're gonna congregate on the hairy vetch where you're, Predatory insects can come eat them or your birds can come eat them and they won't be bothering your more valuable plants. And then this is just an example of um, a trap crop for rodents. So rodents really like the rose hips. And this is a chipmunk table where they've been eating rose hips from my Ragusa roses and leaving some of my, my, my more valuable fruit crops alone. Um, another way, another trap crop for rodents could be um, sunchokes. So in the winter, rodents like to girdle uh, the, the stems of your fruit trees and your berry bushes. So if you have sunchokes growing nearby, they might prefer to eat the sunchokes underground that you've left in the ground than girdle your bushes. But I'm trying that. I haven't, I, the experiment is not ended, so I can't tell you if it works but Sepp Holzer rec recommends that. Um, he has a, a 140 hectare um, permaculture farm in the, in the mountains of, um, of uh, not Germany, but the neighboring country. And um, he recommends that. So I'll take his word for it. Okay, I, don't, I think I didn't take my full time, but that's the end of my presentation. Um, I have a couple of references I'd like to, um, tell you about. So the Wild Farm Alliance is a not-for-profit group out of California that has a website with bundles of information about how to attract birds to your farm or your garden. And um, they have all kinds of testimonials where farmers have stopped using pesticides because they've, they've attracted all these birds to take care of their pest problems. Um, and they find that they're much more beneficial in terms of taking care of pests than they are destructive in terms of eating whatever the crop is. And then Perry Moon Nursery, Perry Moon Nursery specializes in native seeds of native plants and also they have bare root um, native plants. So if you're particularly interested in attracting uh, the native um, uh, beneficials, uh, you might wanna look into that resource. And then, um, this book, um, Jackie and Eric Tomeyer's Edible Forest Gardens, Volume 2, has tables in the back where they talk about 
every single beneficial creature you could think of and what habitat they prefer and what they eat and their life cycle and all of that. So very, very useful um, tables in the back of that volume. And thank you for listening. And there's my contact information again. And what time is it, someone? At 7.45. OK, so there's plenty of time for questions if people have any. Well, I can start if nobody else uh, has burning questions. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, have you seen bird damage on your, especially the soft, uh, the stone fruits or um, any of your higher tree fruits? It sounds like you do have some predation on your um, berries. Uh, they, yeah, they I, I have, the damage I have on my fruits is the plum curculio. And that's a tricky one to deal with. Um, Chickens can help if they eat the drop fruit, you know, if you can clean up the drop fruit, but the life cycle of that pest is it lives in the woods. It flies in when the fruit is young. It lays its eggs in the fruit. They hatch. They start eating the fruit from the inside out. You can tell it's been there because it leaves a scar like um, if you stick your, like a crescent, like your pinky fingernail would make if it pressed into a, a soft fruit. So the fruit falls to the ground. The pest goes into the ground, it goes into its various phases, and then it flies out of the ground in August and goes back to the woods. And I have lots of woods. So even if I dealt with it in my garden, I would still have them coming in again from the woods the next year. I did actually inculcate my entire garden with the nematode from Shields Lab. That's, it's a native nematode and you can inculcate your ground with it. And so it's a beneficial insect, right? A nematode. Um, and it does, it does predate on all kinds of slugs and other kinds of um, bugs in, in the ground. So I did that and, um, and they came a couple of years later and they tested my soil. And in fact, it had taken hold. So the nematode is in my soil, but um, it's just not really working. So that's my main problem. And None of the, the, the beneficial creatures I talked about seem to deal with the plum curculio. So yeah, if anybody knows how to deal with that. Oh, and I don't spray. So I know you can spray with um, organically approved things like the clay you know, that protects against these pests, but I don't do any spraying. If I did some spraying, I could probably help myself, but I don't do that, so I'm stuck. I'm just hoping that someday Things will get into balance so that the plum curculio simply thins my fruit for me, but doesn't damage all of them. So that's my, did I answer your question? Uh, you answered a different question, which I have <laughs> the answer to. Um, but I don't, honestly, I don't have a lot of predation on my fruit at all from, from the birds. Um, in fact, when I was able to grow peaches, I knew they were ripe when I just saw a peck mark in a peach and then I picked them all. So they helped me actually know when it was perfectly ripe to eat. But no, I haven't seen a lot of problems with birds eating my fruit. Thanks. Um, Scott has a question. Do you have a plant or predator that will help with ticks? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, chickens. Chickens will eat ticks. You don't even need the other kind of bird that makes a lot of noise. Um, chickens will eat ticks if you let them free range. Yep, absolutely. Are there any other questions or any comments people want to make from your experience? you know, share something that helps you. I wonder if anybody's had luck attracting uh, toads or frogs without a water feature on their land for, for spaces where that's not possible. Mm -hmm. um, I No, I think if you let herbaceous plants grow densely, you know, just wild weeds, um, like I said, even in a drought time, they captured enough dew down low that I had this huge um, 
you know, all these leopard frogs last year. And we had quite a drought last summer. So I would say that would work, but maybe other people have other ideas. It sounds like Scott is maybe looking for a more wild option than chickens for, uh, for ticks. I wonder, oh. are there other... Um... I do not know the answer to that, but maybe if you Google the question, you would find out. All right, uh, Mabel's got a question. Uh, where do you recommend getting uh, honeyberries from locally rather than elsewhere? Locally? Um, where is local to you? <laughs> I think they may be talking about oh, Massachusetts, but just North America specifically, rather than getting them from. Yeah, I, I look them up and it seems like they're all over the Northern Hemisphere. Like there's Japanese ones and um, right. well, Russian ones and whatever. Right, they're native. Yeah, they're definitely native to this hemisphere. Um, and there's many nurseries now that are carrying them. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I like to buy them from Hartman's, which is in the upper Midwest. They, they have potted plants, so you can plant them any time of year. Um, but there's many um, rain tree out on the West Coast. I mean, there, there's lots of nurseries carry, carry honeyberries now. You do, okay. need, you do need two different varieties for pollination. That's very important. But if you get them, do you know that they're the ones that are native to this continent? Uh, I think you could ask your nursery that question. Okay, cool. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. You've been great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, we've got a question from Eva. Do you want to come off mute or read that? I can't hear. Um, Eva's asking, do you ever have a situation where planting trap crops brings in pests that you didn't have? I can't think of one. Do you have an example that happened to you? I can't hear. Yeah, no response yet. Okay. And come back to that if there's a um, specific. Uh, hi, I'm so sorry. I'm on my phone and I couldn't figure out where the to where the speaking button is. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> um, I have not had that problem, but I ha I had a conversation a little while back with someone who was like who had mentioned that that might be an issue, and I like not that I've ever been really terribly concerned about planting things for other things like I plant extra for everybody so mm -hmm. that everybody has some and yeah. um but I don't know it just somebody put it in my mind at one point and I thought well I don't I haven't had that experience but maybe and like an experienced person has had that experience no and I think you're I love what you do planting enough for everyone so I feel that way too share and share alike let the birds have some let's you know just let all the creatures have some and there's plenty for us too. And that actually goes along with the theme for this um, conference, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. Yeah, Eva, I'll say I, I, that is something I've heard farmers say that they've had experience with, um, but I, as, as far as I can remember, it's always in like monocultural situations where yeah. they try adding one little strip and, um, you know, they say, oh, like now I've got something that I didn't. Or um, another example is a small organic orchard surrounded by conventional orchards where um, their neighbors blame them for <laughs> attracting crops or pests that they hadn't had otherwise. Um, right, because the, they're the neighbors are spraying, so the pests are coming to the organic. Yeah. Um, and then the and then the neighbors consider the organic farm the source of um, rather than the refuge for. Those 
I have a friend who who kind of apprenticed herself under me and she lives in Maryland now and she um, bought a new house and she's planting her entire garden in edibles and beneficials, you know, flowers and so on. And she has all the birds and the bees and the insects in her yard, whereas her neighbors who are using Roundup and whatever else don't have any. Um, Stephanie asks, I have two honeyberries, but I've never had a crop. What could be the problem? They could be the same variety. You need two different cultivars. The other possibility, if they're different varieties, they may be blooming at different times. So the pollinators are not bringing pollen from one to the other because they're blooming at different times. There's a, there's a cultivar called berry blue which is considered kind of a universal pollinator because it blooms over a long period of time. Um, I have a couple of those in my garden and I have, I probably have a dozen different varieties of, um, of honeyberries because, um, and they do bloom at different times. So that could be part of the issue um, or they're both the same. That's what I would say. And if neither of those things is true, I don't know the answer. <laughs> Danny, I wonder, you talked about um, netting some of your yes. berries. Um, mm -hmm. Have you had trouble maintaining the nets in uh, the kind of jungle ecosystem that that you set up? Uh, have you had other plants? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I, okay, my garden is extremely diversified, but for ease of harvesting, I group similar plants together. And when I plant them, if I know I'm gonna have to net them, I think about how I'm gonna do that. So for example, I have a row of honeyberries. It's a straight row, it's under plum trees, but I can put a net over that whole row. But I have to I have to make sure I weed whack around it just so that it's flat ground, you know, so I can lay. So I usually I use a net and I usually use one by three slats, like eight foot long slats of wood um, to hold it down. Or um, you know, we we use a uh, PVC plastic for our hoop houses. And when a windstorm destroys it, we have all this, all these long pieces of PVC plastic that are now no longer useful. I use those to hold down <laughs> the edges of the net. Um, and you have to have a big enough net. So I used to have a seven foot wide net and now my honey bears are so big, I need to use a 14 foot wide net to cover them. Um, I've also, I cover my, my gooseberries, um, and this year, you know, I used to be really wanting to lay anchor to the ground. Eh, this year, I just sort of laid it over the bushes and laid those um, PVC pipes over them. And they were actually suspended above other plants. Um, so the birds didn't really get to it because the plants were so dense. The chipmunks might have been able to, but I, don't, I didn't have a lot of chipmunk pressure this year for some reason. So, you know, I was okay. But you know, yes and no. I don't net a whole lot of things. I net my honeyberries, I net my um, my some of my gooseberries, and that's and my grapes. So you know, when they start to ripen late in the season, um, I they're on a fence. So I just drape a fourteen foot wide net over that fence, and I anchor it the same way I told you, and that seems to take care of it. But it's a good question. I mean, it's not, you know, but it, I can work around it. Yeah. <laughs> 